of course, for Irish people and people of Irish descent, um, tomorrow and Monday and most of next week also have another significance, that of national independence. Ireland is blessed with a, what might be called the only movable national revolutionary day in history since we have the Easter River Rising, which started on the 24th of April originally because Easter Monday fell on that day that year. Let's share some facts about it. Um, I imagine some people know some basic facts about it. This is the National Army Museum from Ireland, which loves resizing pages as you scroll down it. I've used it before. It has a love of this. Easter Rising. On Easter Monday 1916, Irish nationalists launched an armed revolt against British rule in Ireland, though quickly suppressed by the British Army, the Rising was a seminal moment in modern Irish history, helping pave the way to the nation's independence in 1922. All true, although it would be nice to have a further background, but then again, it's supposed to be a brief overview. This famous picture is of British soldiers on a barricade. It was probably taken after the event. It looks rather posed and a number of historians have pointed out it looks far too posed to actually have been taken during the fighting. And I was probably taken when it was all over. The Easter Rising took place against a backdrop of increased political tension. This was caused by British reluctance to influence home rule, enacted by the 7, 1914 Government of Ireland Act, and the assertion that could only be done if military conscription was also introduced to Ireland, which didn't happen, although nearly did near the end of the First World War. The linking of conscription and home rule outraged Irish nationalists of all persuasions, but the militant Irish Republican Brotherhood, which you can to an extent see as the forerunners to the IRA, although that's arguable and a messy, messy way of looking at it, and the Irish Republican Brotherhood would probably benefit from their own video along with sections of the Irish volunteers and Irish citizens and army opted for a violent re response. Irish War News, a, a newspaper published by the rebels, they published, I think, one or two issues of this during the uprising. Libby Hall headquarters, which was the headquarters of the Irish citizen army and which was shelled to bits during the sort of, they've identified it as a rebel headquarters. It was um, to an extent true. I suppose the Irish citizen army did contribute quite a lot of the manpower, but it was only one place. British response, the revolt came as something of a shock to the British. Their intelligence mistakenly believed the plot had been postponed following the Royal Navy's recent interception of smuggled German weapons. Um, yes, the 20,000 rifles uh, smuggled on the Ord, which were... Um, intercepted and sunk. It took the better part of a day to organise a response, which was inevitably armed. There were only a few troops in Dublin, so soldiers were rushed there from elsewhere in Ireland, including Curry in County Kildare, and from across the sea in Britain. Apparently some of the troops landing in Ireland from Britain had no clue where the hell they were and thought they were in France, especially some of the Sherwood Foresters, who were like, what's this, where are we? Some of them were uh, green, nascent, newly tra trained troops. Sackville Street, now called O'Connell Street, barricaded with motor cars, May 1916. Again, that's probably been taken after the end of the fighting. 18-pounder um, shell case fired during the Easter Rising. Um, and here we have some quotes from people who, during the fighting. Bulls Bridge was uh, reached at noon, and as the advanced... Uh, Guard, advance would probably be better. Crossed a heavy fire was opened on them from the front and the flank. It was tri a trying ordeal for such young troops of who many had only three months' service. As you can see, that goes back to my earlier point about green troops with very little of us. Especially, it was impossible to see where the enemy who were concealed in the house was firing from. Um, the battalion bombed in the Doors of houses occupied by the enemy and drove them out, but the battalion continued to lose men heavily all along the Cumberland Road. Uh, we're probably talking about the Battle of Mount Street, which carried on for a continual period in reality and had a handful of sort of Irish volunteers holding up a, a very large number of Irish, a very large number of British troops, rather, for a, a longish period and ended up with quite a lot of casualties on the British side. 
in fact, a, a, some people estimate a good 50% of all British casualties occurred in that one incident. And let's accept those cookies. Uh, there were nearly 80 uh, other casualties amongst the other ranks. I'll give a link to the Battle of Mount Street Bridge in a minute. I love the way it resizes these pictures. It's quite amusing. The rebels were slowly driven back in violent street fighting. Many of Dublin's landmarks became the focus of British struggles, including the South Dublin Union Workhouse. Yes, which were, uh, where there was a particularly nasty hand-to-hand -hand fighting, which went on for some time. After several days of intense fighting there, a breach in the wall was made and the building finally occupied. The city was divided into quarters and the rebels steadily pushed into one area. All exits from which were closed, eventually only the GPO remained in their hands. However, unlike some versions of the end of the Easter Rising, like the infamous scene in Michael Collins where they all surrender outside the GPO, in reality they basically made a tunnel out of the GPO and escaped through Moore Street and, the, and did not surrender outside the GPO. British losses were 120 killed and nearly 400 wounded. Around 60 men from the Irish Volunteers and Citizen Army were killed during the revolt. Over 180 civilians also died. You'll find variable reports about those casualty figures, by the way. Um, the casualty figures for the British don't include. There were some actions outside of Dublin as well, so you could probably add another 15 to 20 soldiers lost on top of that. And there were also a few people lost outside of Dublin, but they're broadly accurate. The rising lacked widespread public support at its outset. That's not surprising, really, because Dublin was the heart of where most um, British soldiers who were serving in from Irish instruction were serving in, in the armed forces, and it wasn't going to go down well with them if they lost family in it. And it would also mean that people like wives would lose separation money and wouldn't get paid. Many Dubliners had relatives fighting in the British Army. They did indeed. It's fair to say that there was a more mixed view of it than, than, than there was retrospectively. And the bit about looting shops, which is always mentioned in accounts of it, where people... Um, this came to a head where apparently the rebels actually were forced to shoot a couple of them. Some sort of in um, items from sort of the rebellion. That's Henry Street after the shelling of the rebels. A brooch taken from the body of a Sinn Féin rebel, as they've called him. Strangely enough, Sinn Féin really wasn't as involved in it as people think. Sinn Féin was a minor political party at the time. Executions and internment. The subsequent British military occupation of the city and internment of over 1,400 Republicans, many of whom had little to do with the rising anger, and many increased electoral support for Sinn Féin. Another sort of um, photo. Again, some of these photos are probably posed for propaganda purposes. Both the British and the Irish were quite keen on using these kind of photos both then and during the last, the war, following War of Independence and the Irish Civil War, many Irish Republicans took a dim view of the rising military strategy. I certainly do. Um, uh, I think it was a flawed gambit. Michael Collins, who had fought the GPO, believed the policy of capturing and then holding indefensible, vulnerable posts in the middle of the capital would be foolhardy. Um, at the best, I would say that, you know, if some if you have to strike a blow first in a revolution, it's likely to be a mess and go wrong. And I would allow for that. You know, the first blow in any revolution is not likely going to be something that's very well worked out. This was RT where they did like um, a few years ago because it was the 100th anniversary of the Rising. Um, they did it as, a, as it was imagining it was happening now, basically. And they showed photos of it. This is the ruins of Abbey Street and Sackville Street again, where it's all knocked down. And you've got just a, you've got like the famous Nelson's Column, which was knocked down in an explosion years later. <sighs> if you're not familiar with that, look that up. You may find it amusing. Um, and you've got O'Connell there. And 
as you can see, the city looks a complete mess. It took years to rebuild that bit. There's John Redman, a man who is now more or less forgotten in Irish history. He was a leader of the Irish Parliamentary Party, which was pushing for home rule by political means rather than a revolution. But Redman is now sort of um, a latter, latter known figure, lesser known and forgotten to any but the, those who study the period more deeply. The Irish Republican Army, the leaders of the insurrection, um, all of them lined up. All of these guys, with the exception of Countess Markovic there, and Eamon de Valera down there, would be killed, basically. And to put one myth to, to rest, Eamon de Valera was not lightly spared because he was America, born in America. If that was the case, Thomas J. Clark, who's right next to him, would have, uh, was also an American citizen and was not spared. This is actually a far more useful resource and seems to go into more depth, so I'll put, leave this one up as a link. What have we learned then 108 years later from the revolution? Certainly, Ireland doesn't have what the proclamation pub, um, promised. Here's the East Rising Proclamation. As you can see, it's the mismatch somewhat in the printing. It was printed in a hurry. And I'll read out some sections. The Irish Republic is entitled to and hereby claims the allegiance of every Irish man and every Irish woman. The Republic guarantees religious and civil liberty, equal rights and equal opportunities to all its citizens and declares its resolve to pursue the happiness and prosperity of the whole nation and all of its parts, cherishing all the children of the nation equally and oblivious of the differences carefully fostered by an alien government, which divided a minority for the majority in the past. I don't think that's been um, achieved yet or anything like it. Can it be achieved is another matter entirely. Um, tomorrow we'll see the Irish government will, as it does each year, it will send a, a group of troops, probably a platoon strength at most, a couple of hundred. Someone will read out the proclamation outside the GPO and everyone will try and claim the, the rising as their sort of tradition and and hang on to it but whether anyone really has the right to it anymore or whether anything's been learned yet or whether any of the objectives in this proclamation have been achieved or whether they're even achievable is another matter